Hello everybody and welcome to the best obscure indie games of 2024. So far, I've been sick for the past two weeks so I accidentally missed the video deadline. Oops! This is gonna be more of like a chill recommendation video. There's gonna be some b-roll but probably not a whole lot unless I veto that in editing, who knows. But today we're gonna talk about eight different games. Four of them are free, two of them are demos, and two of them are full games that we're gonna talk about. I tried to find games that released this year and also tried to find some like super obscure ones that like nobody knows about. Uh, I broke both of those rules apparently immediately. The first one we're gonna talk about is Indigo Park. We're just gonna get the most popular recommendation out of the way at the very start so that way we can get to the good stuff. I'm, I'm not saying Indigo Park is bad, I'm just, you, you get what I'm saying, right? This is why I write my intros. <laughs> First, I have to mention not only is this the most popular game on the list, but it's more than just a mascot horror. It's got comedy, a lovable main character, and gives me Portal vibes for some reason. I played this with some friends a few weeks ago as soon as it was released, and it was honestly a super fun time. It's not too scary, so if you like walking simulators, but still want like a little bit of suspense, I definitely recommend this and I know some people like to use walking simulator as an insult not me That's a compliment. Also, this is only chapter one Which is free on Steam and the rest of the chapters actually got kickstarted since this game got overwhelming Appreciation as well as merch sales in the form of plushies The internet is obsessed with this game and its character and honestly, it's completely just the world feels excitingly optimistic yet dingily stark at the same time. A perfect combination of comedy and drama. Making this game a dramedy, if you will. It's hard to talk about this game without giving spoilers, and at a runtime at only 30 minutes, I'd say give it a shot, even if you aren't into mascots or horror. I'm into neither, yet I found this game to be a breath of fresh air in the mascot horror landscape. And if you still don't want to play it because you don't play scary games, I don't play scary games either. Except for that one time where I basically cured my childhood fears by playing a liminal space horror game. So honestly, exposure therapy works! But honestly with a huge asterisk, because I'm not a medical or mental professional. Just some depressed guy on the internet who learned to articulate his thoughts and feelings in the form of a script, because for some reason I like writing about topics that I actually care about. Next one is Die in the Dungeons Origins, another free game. While I tried to keep this list to games that have only released this year, this one has a little bit of a caveat that technically still counts as a game that could release this year. See, Die in the Dungeons isn't technically out, except Die in the Dungeons is technically out. And there's also a demo, which I didn't play, but instead I played Die in the Dungeons Origins, and there's a specific difference here. These are two different games for some reason, which is currently the most recent adaptation that is available, and is the prologue, and basically is an updated version of the original game. Another overwhelmingly positive banger on our hands. I love these kinds of strategy games, where there is like just enough of a learning curve that once you nail it down, it just becomes second nature at that point, leading you to use another part of your brain to occupy it with something else at the same time. Yes, it's a roguelike deck builder, and to me, I will try any game that has this specific feature because it is some of the most addicting and satisfying gameplay loops I've found in gaming. And it isn't too stressful either. So it's a good genre of game to detox to, you know, like after work. Basically, you have this board which you can input dice into. Each dice has a specific ability that will impact the outcome. After combat, you gain more dice, complete a story beat using dice, and gain relics to influence your gameplay. I love this game so much and it's free, so you might as well try it. Next is Bronzebeard's Tavern which is also free. This game is an absolute blast to play with friends. Yes, you can play single player, which was my first experience with this game. And since I love games like Diner Dash, specifically SpongeBob Diner Dash, that game hits different in a way I cannot explain. You think I would love this game just because. However, this game was meant to be multiplayer. Kind of like Overcooked, another great cooking game. However, the difference is you're not just in the kitchen, but you're seating people, taking orders, cooking, Cleaning, stocking the ingredients, preparing meals, making sure you don't run out of power, fighting skeletons if you forget about the power. It feels like you're running an 
actual restaurant. So many different variants of meals and drinks, any of which you can choose to put on the menu. So preparation is very important. You basically have to come up with a battle plan before customers arrive. And the game lets you take your time in planning a strategy. Because once those front doors open, it's a diner dash in every which way. Having one person at each station usually makes the experience a little bit smoother. Though over time, you will need multiple people at one station to resolve certain situations that may come up. By far, this is the best cooking simulator game I've ever played. For its vibes, charms, characters, and the sheer chaos that just automatically ensues. If you have a few friends, boot up this game and share in the experience of running a dwarves tavern. Or you could even go online with strangers and have an even more chaotic experience. At least that is what happened when I played the game. You want to you only want to buy, only what, buy you what you need on the menu, menu that you place, that you place on, the on the tavern. Oh my gosh. It's An actual this, person. It's, 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 <laughs> this thing has voice chat? Next is another free game, Nightmare Cards. I already love the 4x3 aspect ratio. I'm a sucker for that. While using a controller, we can select campaign or free play. In free play, there is free race and free battle. Eight courses to choose from, multiple power-ups, customizable AI characters, only five characters to choose from currently, and I chose the hunter. Right out the gate, for a first time playing this, the music is oddly cheery for such a dark atmosphere. There's items you can pick up and use, enemies scattered about the map, and hitting opponents is really fun. First time I played, I got first with an AI difficulty of normal, even though it felt like I was losing the entire time. Free battle is a different story. Six game types and bloodbath is the one I chose. There are arrows above both your teammates and enemies, so it was really easy to target the enemies. Campaign starts off with a dialogue box in front of some dream watchers, and we must sign a contract with a name, confirm a voice, choose a cart, and a cutscene plays. We are now in the tutorial, which is probably what I should have done first. I love that the game has a save to memory card option. This game is great! Each section of the campaign is a level with voice acting in the cutscenes and different characters to race against, which grants you more insight. For a free kart racer on Steam, I'd say it's worth a try. I wasn't expecting a campaign mode, but I actually really like it. The only downside that I've found is that there's no online mode, only single player and local play. But for this specific aesthetic, it makes a lot of sense. Hi everybody! Um, so... My video comes out in two days, and I have a bit of a problem. Um, I found a brand new game that I'm in love with. Currently editing the rec video for it right now, but I also want to include it in this video with this list because this game is actually so good and you need to play it and it's freaking free. It's so good. Here, here's a little bit of a highlight thing. This game is incredible. I love it. This is probably like my favorite roguelike now. So here's a little bit of context. I made this video years ago in 2022 called the fourth annual thankful awards and one of these people are Jack Sather. He just came out with a video where he finishes his game. I've been following this guy for a long time and I love a lot of his videos. This was the video that I literally just finished watching. We are going to be playing his game for the first time and I'm so excited because it's been really cool seeing Jack uh, rise on YouTube over the years and so I'm super excited to finally play his very first game so let's go it's a timer based game where you have to wait until the round ends and then you can uh, buy stuff I know some people had problems with the bow but I think the bow is pretty great what's a good like melee weapon strategy for this game because so far what I found is windmilling seems to be the strat there was a bit of a learning curve but now I feel like I'm in the flow, in the zone. It seems like that there's like infinite shop time, which is nice. I will play this game for hours. I will spend money on this game. I'm not even kidding. I I actually love this game. I knew I was gonna love it the second I saw gameplay and I'm like, oh yeah. Oh, the music goes hard. Oh, it's the perfect vibe for this game. Love the art style, love the enemies. I genuinely love everything about this game. Okay, so this is a very momentum based game. That's the hardest part is keeping up the momentum of melee weapons. I like that it, this is like a velocity thing. Like if you tap it, then it's less damage than if you like do a, like a full hit. I could play this game all day. I, I'm not even joking. This is the kind of person I am. 
I love these kinds of games. All right, so now we've gotten to the first demo of this list, and that is Super Farming Boy. I freaking love this game. Imagine if Harvest Moon, or if you're younger than that, Stardew Valley, but add combos, a Cuphead-like villain, and the main character is a superhero. That is basically Super Farming Boy. Instant download. Now, I'm supposed to write two more paragraphs about this game, but if you want to play it, I suggest downloading the demo like right now before it disappears, since the full game isn't out yet. But man, the demo is super fun. What I love about this game is that it starts you off with basically everything. as like a tutorial section in a sense, and then it takes all that away, so that way you actually have to earn it yourself. This gives you a glimpse of how much fun you can have with this game, and then makes you work for it, while also adding stakes and motivation for you to keep playing due to story reasons. And it does all this in like the first five minutes of the game. There's multiple stores where you can purchase from, the vegetables are sentient, so sometimes you you have to catch them as if you're playing a weird episode of Veggie Tales. Combos are possible if you dig up plants. There's a supercharged mode that lets you go ballistic on all the vegetables. You can fly. Honestly, it's just like a super wholesome game. Can't recommend it enough. Now we're at the next demo. Dungeon Clark. I love when indie games take one concept and another concept and just mashes them together. This brings us to Dungeon Clark. I love this name so much. Imagine a turn-based RPG, but in order to attack, you must use a claw game to pick up attacks, shields, items, or other items that will help you in combat. I've played this game for hours, and let me tell you, I have the scoop on which is the best character in the entire game. We have Sir Bunalot, which gives you swords and shields. Felina, which has rings, lasers, and shields. Count Clawula, daggers and swords. Dolly, with daggers, a double-sided blade, spikes, shields, and health potions. Then we have the other characters that I haven't unlocked yet because I literally just started playing this game like a few days ago. So I haven't unlocked Benny Beaver or Bernie. But at the time of recording this, I actually did unlock Benny Beaver, and he's, he's okay. Not my favorite. It's fine. However, there is one character that I have not mentioned yet, and that is Scrappy, the best character in the game. See, each character has a special ability for completing a run, except Sir Bunalot. All my homies hate Sir Bunalot. Scrappy's special ability is a magnet, which helps you pick up more stuff, which is very important to this game. Because obviously, the more you pick up, the more damage you can do. While I am sad that there's only the demo available currently, it doesn't feel like a demo, because the gameplay loop is very similar to a roguelike. Probably because it is. So you will die a lot of times, leading you to restart. But hey, as long as you play Scrappy, I think you'll do a great job. All right, so now we're finally at the first paid game. This game costs actual money, but I do have a lot of things to say about it. Now this is the second to last game on the list. Fell the deck. If you didn't know, I actually already reviewed this game with Red on the Rec channel. So here is a abridged, edited down version of that review before we get to the best game I've played this year. I love this game. It took a while, but I think it was worth it. That was really fun. This game is very dense, and if you're tired, a lot of things are gonna go over your head. So you really have to pay attention to the story, right? I think it made sense for the most part. It's very dialogue heavy, so it's very exposition heavy. I liked the combat a lot. I thought it was a very unique approach on combat specifically. And I did like that a lot. I think the combat was probably my favorite part. I liked yeah. some of the characters a lot, which was nice. Yeah, there, there were some pretty good jokes pretty good joke writing. I think this game is a one and done game. Yeah. It felt like that there were a lot of side quests that we kept like running into. It gave us more, little more hints on what to do, especially with the invisible monster. We still, we never beat that. Yeah, I think that was just like a secret boss. Yeah, some of the combats, it like, it just, it didn't give you enough like XP for it to feel satisfied. Like that last combat, I feel like I should have gotten like 500 gold minimum. I feel like some of the other combats were more satisfying than like the final boss, honestly. Like when it was like five, it was like, okay, I really have to like focus here. They could use different death sounds. That's another it's thing. It's the same death sound. Oh! It, was the same, it, was the, yeah. it was the same death sound over and over again. Yeah, that definitely. It's all painted. Oh yeah. Like, They're like art wise, it is extremely impressive for sure. So it definitely yeah. gets props there. This is definitely like an art first game which is cool. The side quests actually like do reward you. So that's good. Otherwise it wouldn't yeah. be worth it. Seven out of 10. I was going to say like an eight. Yeah. So was, the middle would be like 7.5. Yeah, 7.5 out of 7. 10. 7.5 yeah. is fair. Yeah. 7.5 out of 10. And now it's time to talk about the best roguelike I've ever played. This one had a lot of anticipation. It was in early access for a while, 
and it is genuinely my favorite game that has released so far this year. And that game is... Inkbound. No, I still haven't played Hades 2, and this game is why. I'm gonna be real for a minute here. One of the reasons why I love roguelikes so much is not only because the gameplay loops are so satisfying to me, but also I'm broke. And being able to play a game for tens of hundreds of hours without it getting boring at a price point that is actually affordable is honestly a great achievement. I know I've only played it for about 40 hours so far, but there is still more to do in the game. With daily quests always refreshing, me attempting to complete certain quests so that way I can finally unlock that specific character, which makes completing those quests actually satisfying. The game devs removing microtransactions from the game to improve player experience, so now there's only in-game currency. And if you really wanted to support the devs besides buying the game, there are cosmetic packs that you can buy, although it's not pushed or encouraged, just silently available on the Steam page. This is how you make a game with the players first in mind, not the game dev's wallet. And if I can support a dev studio that is actively trying to fight the pressure of not having a microtransaction store in your game, then I will do everything in my power to help push this game to more people, especially because it's actually really fun. There are multiple classes in the game that are actually different from each other that are unlocked by actually playing the game. There are vestiges that improve your stats in the game that you can only get in game. Multiple options of what kind of attacks and abilities you want. You get to choose where to go. It's fun as both a single player and multiplayer experience and the story is completely optional so if you'd rather focus on gameplay like me then you can because this game actually lets you play how you want to play i normally don't like to give game scores because i find video games to be a complicated art form where there are so many different aspects to consider and also i like for people to come up with their own opinions about the game instead of blindly agreeing with my score or anybody's score honestly however if i were to give any game a score of 10 out of 10 it would be inkbound for sure i love this game so much and i appreciate the perspectives of the devs who made it and if you try any game on this list it's worth the 30 dollars price tag also it's by the same people who made monster train and i freaking love that game